Welcome to the 405th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. Stay tuned for my interview with Richard Roper, author of the debut novel, Something to Live For. Stay tuned for the interview. The Reading and Writing Podcast is brought to you by Libro FM. Libro.fm lets you purchase audiobooks directly from your favorite local bookstore. You can pick from more than 185,000 audiobooks, including bestsellers and recommendations from booksellers. You'll get the same audiobooks at the same price as the largest audiobook company out there, but you'll be part of a different story one that supports your local community and your local bookstore. If you're new to audiobooks, they're the perfect way to get more books into your busy life. You can listen during your commute, while doing chores, walking the dog, or just relaxing at home. All you need is a smartphone and the free Libro.fm app. If you already love audiobooks and don't know what to listen to next, check out recommendations and curated lists from people who know audiobooks best, your local bookseller. Here's your special offer from the Reading and Writing Podcast. Get two audiobooks for the price of one today with your first month of membership with the code RWPODCAST at checkout. This offer is only valid for new members in Canada and the U.S., Check out Libro.fm today. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Richard Roper, author of the debut novel, Something to Live For. The novel is getting a lot of attention. Rave reviews from the New York Times Book Review, People, and Entertainment Weekly. Selections is Indie Next, Library Reads, and Barnes & Noble Discover Picks, and spots on numerous Best of Summer lists, including the Wall Street Journal and Parade Magazine. Richard, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Great. If someone listening hasn't heard about your novel, Something to Live For yet, how would you describe the novel? I suppose, really, it's I've always thought of it as a bit of a dark comedy or a dark rom-com because um, ultimately it's a love story, but it has some fairly uh, serious themes in there. Loneliness kind of being uh, the main one. I hope it's, uh, yeah, it's a, a rom-com that takes you on a bit of a journey. And do you remember the original idea or impetus for writing your novel, Something to Live For? Yes, it was one of those sort of kind of light bulb moments. And I'm really hoping that it's not the only one I have where I was just I was on uh, a lunch break at work, just mindlessly scrolling through different articles online. And I came across this uh, story about uh, local authority workers in the north of England whose day job it is to deal with the situation where someone has died alone. So they go out to the house once the sort of police report is, is cleared up. There's no foul play or anything like that. They will go and check um, the person's house to see whether they've got a, a next of kin, just to try and piece together clues about this person's life. Because if they didn't have any friends or family around them when they died, then there's no real way of finding out what their sort of situation is, what their financial situation, and all of that. And the article was fascinating because it. obviously this is just someone's day job this is their kind of nine to five but it it was heartbreaking and kind of hopeful in equal measure because for a lot of you know it it is a a very sad thing to be had to be spending your days doing that but everyone that was involved everyone that was interviewed was so calm and warm and it seemed that they all would if the funeral was to happen where it didn't look like there were going to be any f- uh, family or friends there, then all of the, the local authority people would go to the funeral just to make sure that there was someone there. And that kind of, I just thought there's got to be a sort of a, a character here that that does this job, which is in fact what happens in the book. So Andrew, the main character of the book, that is his job. So yeah, it, that was the, sort of the initial thing that kind of sprang it for me. And it, it was, yeah, one of those, like I say, I hope it's not a rare thing, but it all seemed to the story kind of flow very naturally from there. So that the end result of the book is probably, I would say, obviously there was a lot that happened in the editing process, but there are only really a, a couple of minor changes to the thing that sort of appeared in front of me, like a mad sort of miracle. And had you written fiction before you wrote this novel? So I had nothing that had ever been published. I'd actually written 
um, two novels before this one. The, the first one, I sent it out to a literary agent and I got signed up and it just didn't, the book didn't uh, get picked up by a publisher, unfortunately. And then I just heard that the thing to do when you're, first book is out on submission is that you basically throw yourself into a new project into a new task so I I was well underway writing something else and then I got to the end of it of a sort of first draft and I just thought I just had a real sort of strange kind of spidey sense that this wasn't the book this wasn't going to be the thing that kind of started my career that anyone would pay attention to so I luckily in retrospect shelved it and just I was thinking about what to do and then I suddenly had the idea for something to live for. So I'm glad that I was patient and listened to my instincts. You've worked in book publishing yourself as a nonfiction editor at Headline in the UK. Did that knowledge of publishing help you as you worked to get something to live for published? Yeah, definitely. I think it's a strange one, really, because, yeah, I'm a nonfiction editor. So it's a very different beast the way things work with fiction. And it's been quite a strange learning process for me because I, as in at this point, because I just thought that I knew how the whole industry worked, but fiction is completely different. But what has helped is that for the last seven or eight years, I've been uh, sitting on a bench in the office next to some incredible publishers and editors who have been in the business for 30 years who you know I sit very close to Maggie O'Farrell's editor for instance Sarah Winman's editor the, and they're just some absolutely in, incredible people and I would sit in our joint editorial meeting and I would listen to the way that these incredible editors pitched books that they were thinking of acquiring or and quite often they would talk with real passion about a, a book a submission that they'd had and They would go on to say how brilliant the writing was, how vivid the characters were, all of this. And then they would just say something like, oh, but it just didn't quite, doesn't quite fit, just doesn't quite work in the slots we've got coming up. And it's that point we realised that you've got to have everything kind of all your ducks in a row, everything's got to be lined up so that when you're submitting something, you're just, all I could, all I was imagining was, one of these editors pitching my book and hearing them say, yes, it would be perfect for this slot and here's how we do it. So I think there was, it certainly helped being around so many incredible people. I think that's the main thing, but in terms of it's helping me or in in giving me a kind of leg up, I don't think it really did, particularly because I think for one thing, I think there's a real sense, I think in any industry, there's a lot of gossip that happens. And I think particularly in publishing, when you know there's someone in publishing who's writing a book, the initial impulse from everyone is to be a bit gossipy about it and a bit kind of catty and almost hope that it's a <laughs> that it doesn't work. <laughs> I know that sounds like a really cynical way of looking at things, but I think it's just human nature. So I think there's no way that people would have even looked at the book if it wasn't up to scratch with that in mind, I think. Well, when you were mentioning earlier the inspiration for Something to Live For, this article that you read at lunch, the plot and the kind of structure of the novel – was it there for you from the very beginning or did you do any plotting or outlining before you started writing the story? I think the kind of one of the really helpful things that happened, the process of writing those two previous novels, which didn't get published and the second one I didn't even send out was that, but at that point I hadn't really done any reading about structure or plotting or any of those types of things. It was really just just getting from the start and getting to the end. And I thought I had an innate sense, hopefully, about taking the reader on a journey and all of that. But I very luckily, just at the point as I that I read that article, I started reading a few. I read some incredible books, which now all the titles escape me, apart from a, a book called Into the Woods by John York, which is, he was a, a, a TV writer and, a, and an essayist in England. And he just had... The, Reading that was a kind of complete sort of shift in my focus about the way you structure a novel and just in terms of things like tension and just all the sorts of things where you think well, that's obvious, but it's only when you have to apply it practically that that it then makes sense when you're you've got all these pieces you've got I had the character I thought well there's, the character is going to do this job because that's a fascinating job and then I thought what's his actual story though what's the, where, where are we where's he going to start and where's he going to end so I knew that he was going to start in a church at one of these funerals as the only person there and then I just thought okay well, what's going to be what's the closing scene going to be and what do I need to take him from that place to that place and so I think so I had that all in mind and then the thing that sort of that really helped me then with the structure and the plot was that 
I was using some of my own experiences about when I was thinking about what the book was going to be. And one of the things that, as I mentioned at the start, the big sort of overriding theme of the book is loneliness. And that was something that in a, in a mild sense, I had been dealing with at that point in my life after having moved to London in my mid twenties and thinking that I think you have that image in your head about what happens when you move from a small town in the middle of nowhere to the big city, that it's going to be this sort of endless parade of parties <laughs> that you're going to you know, meet a thousand different people. And it's, if anything, I found it the opposite. And it's, and that becomes all the more stark when you realize that you're in a big city and you're constantly seeing people, but you're not finding it, you're finding it really difficult to make connections. And the, the thing that happened, which really then gave me the sort of the structure and the kind of heart of the story was that I was in my shared work kitchen one morning and for whatever reason I hadn't done anything at the weekend I think kind of a couple of friends that I made just weren't around and so I just had a fairly sort of lonely weekend where I hadn't really done much or seen anyone and a colleague just in that way you do when you're making a cup of tea in the office on a Monday morning just asked me what I'd done at the weekend and I just on autopilot just went oh I, I saw some friends and then she said oh what did you do and I was like huh and I just automatically said, to, oh, we went to, and I was panicking. And I said, yeah, we went to a museum. And she said, all right, what museum did you go to? And then I ended up in this sort of mad kind of thing where it was like I was like I'd committed a murder and I was hastily improvising an alibi or something. It was bizarre. <laughs> and so I just said so that really was then the kind of the spark for the idea because the thing that's happening in Andrew's life, the protagonist in the book, is that his colleagues and yeah, the people around him think that he's got this great life away from the office, that he's got a family and other friends and everything's going great. And that isn't the case. And it was so it was at the point where I thought well, that that is the kind of the tension for the book where it's a man who's who's doing this job every day where he's dealing with the situation with low with lonely people and he's very much kind of one of them. So at that point and then I obviously I knew that there was going to have to be someone who, a character who came in to try and help him see the light, which is uh, Peggy in the novel. And so that, to go back to your original question, is, yeah, that at that point, it all came together and I managed to the plot that I came from that. It really did happen incredibly quickly. And I, I was feeling so smug about it when it all came together. And now, of course, I'm in the middle of writing my second book where the plot has changed about a thousand different times. So I'm really looking back at that moment. And if at the time I'd known what a one-off it was going to be. I think I would have been even more smug to be honest, but there we go. <laughs> so I was just about to ask you if you're working on another novel now. Yes, I am. I'm I'm in the edits at the moment. In fact, literally as we started recording this, my uh, editor in the States has sent through a cover, which I've not opened yet because I this is my whenever I get a cover or some edits or anything, I spend about three days waiting to open the email because I almost can't bear it. But there we go. But so yeah, no, I'm I'm in the middle of the... Second one, I yes, working on edits, and uh, yeah, it's been an interesting process. Been a very different way of writing. Having a deadline is is something that I thought would help me, and it turns out it doesn't. It just makes me a bit scared. So there we go. But I'm I'm getting there. I think so. It's been a strain. It's been a a different process to the first book, and the, with this one, it's yeah. The initial, if I was to look back and find the kind of the initial kind of one pager I came up with the book, it probably doesn't bear a huge amount of resemblance to that at all. So yeah, it's been a, an interesting an interesting process doing it this time around. So how did you get into publishing yourself, the nonfiction editing that you do? I think it was my second year of university where I was studying English literature. And I had that moment, which I think probably 99% of English students have, which is to go, oh, how do I in any possible way turn this into a career? <laughs> uh, and I just really, in a kind of wild panic, started looking around and thinking, what's going to happen when I finish this degree? And publishing just, I think like a, when you're not in publishing, I think you imagine it that the, the publishing really is just a few people in an office spell checking and then someone presses print on a big printer and then it <laughs> the book magically appeared. Or at least that's how I incredibly naively thought about it. I had no idea that there were these different... What you doing? Trying on glasses with Zenny's 3D Virtual Try-On. Wow, that's pretty cool. But those glasses kind of make you look like your Uncle Bob. Oh, not exactly the look I was going for. Um, okay, how about these clear glasses? Oh, or these round ones? Very on trend. I like both on you. You know, I also like these aviator sunglasses. Wait, are those the actual prices? I say get all of them. Seriously, why not, right? Oh, now I want new glasses. Zenni.com, quality prescription glasses starting at $6.95. Departments and, and how the whole thing works. And it just didn't really 
seemed like there was a kind of viable career option. But I managed to somehow, luckily, luck my way into a sports book publisher, a tiny little independent uh, press in the middle of the Warwickshire countryside where I'm from. And I, in my head, again, as a sort of naive 21-year-old, I thought, oh, this is publishing. This is it's the big lunches and the fancy dinners and the, and the launch parties and all that. And it was just one bloke in his house. It was The office was his attic. So <laughs> it was a slightly strange route into to it. And so I was there for a couple of years. And then it's weird how these cycles happen. But there was a recession and it sadly went under. And then I well, luckily, I got to then do a bit of traveling. And it was just a pure sort of idle, lazy, we're about to come back. So I better throw out some CVs. And I sent and I, yeah, I think I applied for must have been about 15 jobs. In, and it's an incredibly competitive industry to get into. Well, it was then eight, nine years ago. And I imagine it's even harder now. And I think to be honest with you, with absolute pure luck, I was a CV and a covering letter that my boss um, at Transworld, in, uh, which is part of Penguin in the UK, just happened to pick up. And I just managed to kind of sneak my way in then as, a, yeah, as an editorial assistant eight or nine years ago. So it was I'd, it's the same with writing, really. I'd love to say that I've always loved books and my family's always loved books. And I read all the time when I was a kid. And I'd love to say that I had this grand plan to be a writer and editor ever since I was a kid, but I really have just managed to somehow luck my way into both of them. Given your success to date with something to live for, what writing advice would you offer for those who are writing their own stories and novels? That's a good question. I think the the best bit of advice I've ever heard that's definitely stuck with me is, is write a book that you would want to read yourself. I think... The moment you start trying to second guess where the which books are going to be big in a year's time, or even all oh, these books are really big at the moment, I I write one of those. If you're writing something that's not quite that doesn't really you know it doesn't really sing to you, you do, you can't imagine the idea of picking it off the shelves. Then it just won't it just won't feel real. I think there's a the thing that I've learned when I've in the process of editing at the moment is. If there are any points where I think to myself, oh, I'm not really sure about this scene or, or where this bit's gone, or even this bit of dialogue, but I'll just I'll I'll, I'll come back to it. And then if I don't come back to it, and then I, it goes to my one of my editors, it's still you know, every single time they will pick up on the thing that I've just thought I'm not quite sure about. But let's just see if they notice it, which is obviously ridiculous because of course they're going to notice it. But I think it's without getting too pretentious. I think anything that doesn't feel truthful is is something to avoid. And I think. I've had, I've got this saved on my desktop as my biggest piece of advice. It is going to, if I'm allowed to swear on this podcast very briefly, I hope that's not yes. too much of a problem. I'm now immediately going to lose it. I can't find it now. But it's a piece of, of advice by a writer called Kevin Barry. Oh, here it is. So I'm just going to read this verbatim because it's so good. Okay. Sure. The funny thing about, hang on, he's talking about writing, blah, 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 blah. Oh, here we go. Lots of people can write good stories with good characters and great sentences. What's rare is the stubborn, pragmatic thing that tells you, I've got to do this every single fucking day, even when I don't want to, even when I'd rather pluck out my eyes and feed them to the birds. That discipline combined with talent is very rare. I'd be willing to bet that some of the most brilliant writers who've ever lived have never been published because they weren't prepared to do the work. You have to make sacrifices and be utterly selfish. So that is the thing whenever I'm thinking about having a day of Oh God, I don't know whether I can bring myself to do it today. That I just have to, you know, nail myself to the seat and go. It really is just about grinding it out. And I think I spent certainly when I tried writing my first book, I spent so many wasted hours on the internet, kind of googling how do you write a novel, or sort of looking for advice. Or and I, it wasn't like I knew. I, I, you know, I was still completely winging it. But really, if I just spent all of that time trying to find some sort of magic formula or whatever, if I just sat down and ground out the words and just done the hard slog, then it would have happened a lot quicker. So it's not the most fun advice, but it is really just, yeah, sit down and, and write the bloody book is the main bit of advice. I'm curious with your Google searches, did you ever sit down and take a novel that had already been published and written and basically dissect it or take it apart to figure out how they were able to do that? You know, I did it more with films actually and TV because mm -hmm. I did. I definitely went down a save the cat wormhole, which I think everyone who's writing or trying to write definitely has done at some point. The the Blake Snyder system of you know here's almost you can fit every book or film or whatever into one of these kind of structures, and so I think definitely when I was 
it's a killer, really, because if you're watching a film and you'll go, okay, that's the opening scene. Now we're nine minutes in. That's Well, the film's an hour and a half long, so that's probably going to be the inciting incident happening in four minutes. And here's the midpoint, so there's going to be a big revelation. And it slightly ruins the magic of it. And I think I got a little too obsessed with trying to... Yeah, I definitely picked up some of the books that I loved and tried to put them into those, tried to apply that kind of structure to it. And I think that definitely really helped when I wrote the first book as just as a way of as, as having a, a really sort of basic template of here are when the big beats of the story are going to are gonna have to happen here. You can't have, you can't get to the middle of the book and then nothing's really changed. There's got to be, stakes have got to be raised and all of that. So I think if I'd not done that, then I think it, it yeah, I, I think it, it definitely helped taking things apart a little bit. I think the danger comes when, and I found that to my cost a little bit with the second book actually, is that you almost, you're starting with that and tr- when you haven't got, the idea of the story quite nailed down yet means that you spend an awful lot of time trying to fit something to a formula and then when everything changes then the whole thing has to change so it definitely helped in the first instance but i think you can't really it can only do so much i think what novels or non-fiction books have you read and enjoyed recently oh that's a great question i've been what have i been reading Oh, I tell you what, I mean, this is, I'm always massively behind the times, but the book that I've, my favourite novel of the year, even though I think it was definitely published last year, was Daisy Jones and the Six, which I've now completely forgotten the author's name, but I thought that was, have you read it? I have not, I've heard of it. But it's, I haven't uh, read it. It, it's one of those books where you think on paper it shouldn't work. So the story is it's basically a a fake biography of a band. So it's written as if it's a nonfiction book, but with sort of an oral history of a band. But it, it, it's, it's, which on again, it just sounds like the sort of thing where you think, oh, that's going to be a bit, it's too clever for its own good. But it's just, it's one of those things where once you're sucked in, you, it's just, it, it's game over. It's just, you're immediately, you believe these people are real. It's, a, it's an absolute masterpiece. So I love that. I loved, God, I, this is really exposing how terrible my brain is remembering titles, but I really loved Kylie Reed's book, which I think was nominated for the book. What else? Oh, I'm reading Lucy Foley's new book, The Guest List at the moment. She's a thriller writer. Bizarrely, mm-hmm. she she's British and she and I started out at Headline Publishers as editorial assistants about eight years ago. And then I got sent a piece. I was very uh, lucky that Something to Live For ended up in the New York Times in the paperback row section and my stupid little face was in there and about four column inches over her face was in there and it was just an incredibly <laughs> surreal moment of going if you'd have told us seven years ago when we were making a cup of tea in the crappy kitchen at work that this was going to happen I don't think we would have believed you so yes yeah, so that was a nice moment so that's a great book oh uh, Beth O'Leary's The Flat Share is something I read fairly recently which is fantastic so yes I'm sure there's loads of others but my brain is sure. great. where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your novel so my author website is richardroperauthor.com and then I am on Twitter and Instagram at Richard Roper Great. Again, we've been speaking with Richard Roper, author of the debut novel, Something to Live For. The novel is available now, so go buy a copy. And Richard, thanks for doing this interview. Thanks so much. It's been great. Now stay tuned for a brief excerpt from the audio book of Something to Live For by Richard Roper, read by David Thorpe, available wherever audio books are sold. Andrew looked at the coffin and tried to remember who was inside it. It was a man, he was sure of that, but, horrifyingly, the name escaped him. He thought he'd narrowed it down to either John or James, but Jake had just made a late bid for consideration. It was inevitable, he supposed, that this happened. He had been to so many of these funerals, it was bound to at some point, but that didn't stop him feeling an angry stab of self-loathing. If he could just remember the name before the vicar said it, that would be something. There was no order of service, but maybe he could check his work phone. Would that be cheating? Probably. Besides, it would have been a tricky enough manoeuvre to get away with in a church full of mourners, but nearly impossible when the only other person there apart from him was the vicar. Ordinarily, the funeral director would have been there too, but he had called off sick. Unnervingly, the vicar, who was only a few feet away from Andrew, had barely broken eye contact since he had started the service. Andrew hadn't dealt with him before. He was boyish and spoke with a tremor that was amplified unforgivingly by the echoey church. 
Andrew couldn't tell if this was down to nerves. He tried a reassuring smile, but it didn't seem to help. Would a thumbs up be inappropriate? He decided against it. He looked over at the coffin again. Maybe he was a Jake, though the man had been 78 when he died, and you didn't really get many septuagenarian Jakes. At least, not yet. It was going to be strange in 50 years' time when all the nursing homes would be full of Jakes and Waynes, Tinkerbells and Appletizers with faded tribal tattoos that roughly translated as roadworks for next 50 yards faded on their lower backs. Jesus, concentrate, he admonished himself. The whole point of him being there was to bear respectful witness to the poor soul departing on their final journey to provide some company in lieu of any family or friends. Dignity. That was his watchword. Unfortunately, dignity was something that had been in short supply for John or James or Jake. According to the coroner's report, he had died on the toilet while reading a book about buzzards. To add insult to injury, Andrew later discovered firsthand that it wasn't even a very good book about buzzards. Admittedly, he was no expert, but he wasn't sure the author, who even from the few passages Andrew had read came across as remarkably grumpy, should have dedicated a whole page to bad-mouthing kestrels. The deceased had folded the corner of this particular page down as a crude placeholder, so perhaps he had been in agreement. As Andrew had peeled off his latex gloves, he had made a mental note to insult a kestrel, or indeed any member of the Falcon family, the next time he saw one, as a tribute of sorts. Other than a few more bird books, the house was devoid of anything that gave clues to the man's personality. There were no records or films to be found, nor pictures on the walls or photographs on the windowsills. The only idiosyncrasy was the bafflingly large number of fruit and fibre boxes in the kitchen cupboards. So, aside from being a keen ornithologist with a top-notch digestive system, it was impossible to guess what sort of person John or James or Jake had been. Andrew had been as diligent as ever with the property inspection. He had searched the house, a curious mock Tudor bungalow that sat defiantly as an incongruous interlude in the terraced street until he was sure he'd not missed something that suggested the man had any family he was still in touch with. He'd knocked on the neighbour's doors, but they had either been indifferent to or unaware of the man's existence or the fact it was over. The vicar segued unsurely into a bit of Jesus-y material and Andrew knew from experience that the service was coming to a close. He had to remember this person's name as a point of principle. He really tried his best, even when there was no one else there, to be a model mourner, to be as respectful as if there were hundreds of devastated family members in attendance. He'd even started removing his watch before entering the church, because it felt like the deceased's final journey should be exempt from the indifference of a ticking second hand. The vicar was definitely on the home straight now. Andrew was going to have to make a decision. John, he decided. He was definitely John. And whilst we believe that John, yes, struggled to some extent in his final years and sadly departed the world without family or friends by his side, we can take comfort that, with God waiting, with open arms, full of love and kindness, this journey shall be the last he makes alone. These days, we're all getting more screen time, which means we're also getting more blue light exposure than ever before. Too much blue light can make your eyes feel tired, dry, or blurry. It can also affect your sleep. Zenni's Blocks lenses help to protect the eyes by keeping harmful blue light out. Because they're virtually clear, add blocks to any Zenni frame for stylish, all-day protection. Get a complete pair of prescription or non-prescription Blocks glasses starting at just $24. Protect your eyes now at zenni.com. 